Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Yona Observer. I'm the director of the Jewish Art Salon, a group of artists and scholars. We are a global group. And we are so excited with today's presenters because they are members who have been involved for a number of years and also have been very active and supportive. And, uh, and one of the members brought a guest, Eleonora, so we're very happy to meet her too. Um, so Yehudas Barmet is originally from Boston, lives in Southeast Israel and works in new media assemblage and installation. She holds a BFA from the Pratt Institute in New York and a master's in art from Leslie College, which is in Israel. As a Hasidic Jew, Yehudas is inspired by mysticism, such as artists as Hilma of Klimt, while her methods are born out of American eco-feminist process art movements. Her work focuses on the nexus of individual and community, and she embraces identity as essential to artist artistic expression. Yehudas has exhibited in Israel, the United States, and Europe. With the Jewish Art Salon, she exhibited at the 2017 Jerusalem Biennale, and also at the Durfner Museum in Riverdale with the same exhibition, and our Spinoza exhibit in Amsterdam last year. Um, before I give you to Yehudas, I just wanted to say we are co-sponsored by artist group Yara, who will get a time a little bit later on in the session to speak. So Yehudas, please unmute yourself and let's start the presentation. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, so me and Elinora uh, are two ultra-Orthodox artists and um, we exhibited together um, after receiving a grant from uh, Mifala Pais for ultra-Orthodox artists. Um, I have to say that um, we don't necessarily consider ourselves ultra-Orthodox artists, but that is definitely a uh, large part of our identity and um, and is, um, I imagine, a very um, affects our work and influences the content that, that uh, we bring into our work. Um, Eleanor, would you agree with me about what I just said? Yeah, totally. Okay. Um, um, and um, so when I was thinking, so I originally was thinking of, of um, uh, applying for this grant and I thought about Eleonora. On one hand, we're both very different. We come from very different backgrounds. Our work is has a very different aesthetic and our uh, sensitivity because of our backgrounds. Um, but even so, there's something, there's something that connects us, which is a little bit more under the surface. And, um, and so that's what is uh, what we would like to present today, that despite how contrasting we are, we're still, there's still something that we're working through that is very similar. And you could see that in our aesthetic, um, which is uh, pretty monochromatic on one hand. Um, our choice of, to use color is usually very uh, conscious, conscious to emphasize something. Um, and you'll see soon in our in our virtual tour, um, I'm, I I barely use color at all, and Eleanor uses color very specifically. Um, uh, and we also uh, we also are very biographical, and um, there is an intergenerational theme that is going on. And each of us are going to speak about how that comes out and is expressed in our work. Um, so unfortunately, the curator, we really wanted her to join tonight, but she wasn't able to. So she will be missed, and we will do our best to make up for, for her perspective um, about curating with the two of us. I think that she had, um, uh, I think she had a unique experience dealing with two two women who come from ultra-Orthodox communities um, to see how we deal with our work 
um, where we work, um, um, how, how involved our families are or not involved. Um, so, so it's too bad that she, she can't be here to talk about that, but it's open for questions afterwards also. So we're open to questions about it afterwards. Okay. Um, so Eleanor, what do you think? Should we go into the, into the, uh, virtual tour already? Yeah, I think, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Would you like to start? Let us see. As if you're coming into our gallery and seeing the things and then we'll talk about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fine. So I'm going to do a share screen. Um, and, and uh, we'll go straight into the virtual tour. Um, here we are. Yeah. Okay. Here we are. Um, this is my side. And, and then we go this way. Does everyone see? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. And this is the other side. So Eleonora, um, I'm going to go into your side. And let's start with you. First of all, okay. let me just um, turn around and notice the wall. The name, the name um, of the exhibit is Bright Moon Dark Coffee. The contrast is here. We decided not to, not to avoid the contrast between us. There is. And um, so we'll be happy for questions about that also at the end. Um, and, uh, but even so, I, I think the, the most interesting part of the conversation is not where we contrast, but where, but where we work with similar themes. <laughs> Um, okay, so, so Eleanor, where would you like to start? Um, a few words before <clears throat> looking into it. <clears throat> My work is like a, a collage work. The whole thing, the whole thing ends, end up in a, to a full story. Whatever you make of it, the story that you make of it, but it's like fragments of, of a story, a whole story of a woman. So, um, well, let's go. <laughs> okay. we start with the wall here? Hold on, may I interrupt for one second? Because yes. I had not yet introduced Eleonora, and I'm so sorry about that. Oh, okay. I wanted to do this, and I got so flustered. <laughs> okay, so Eleonora Schwartz is a graduate of the Jerusalem Academy of Music and Dance, she exchanged her life as a secular dancer and actress from Ramat Hasharon for living in a Yiddish-speaking Haredi community in Israel. In recent years, she has returned to working as a clandestine artist. Love to know what that means. <laughs> I hope you'll talk about that. Um, she joined the studio of her own program and recently graduated from Musrara in photography. So thank you for being with us. Please continue. Thank you. By having me. So um, my exhibit is mostly five, five videos, I think, and a few um, photographs, fragments of my body. And usually I'm using my body. Uh, as a former dancer, that's my language. That's how I use things. And I used to be a performer, so the videos mostly have me inside of them. So one of them, which is Café Shachor, with black coffee, that's the one, yes. Um, you can see it first, it's not a long one. I go to this one too, Eleanor? 
doesn't work so well. Hmm? But you didn't see the, we didn't see the, the end of it. Oh, should I go back? No, so that's, oh, that's okay, but leave it to the end. Okay. So those two videos uh, work together aside, alongside, as you see. And in one of them, I'm just with a white surface behind me and uh, dressed as a woman. And in the other one, I'm right into, how do you call it in English? I don't know. <laughs> cupboard, cupboard room, like, yeah, closet room. And then I decided to wear a white share of the men, the Haredi men, and do the same thing. So it works alongside um, with my feet and my hands. And there is the other one uh, on top. There's the video. Yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. <coughs> See the the Haredi men. They have the payas, the, those things that they roll on the hair, a, a part of the hair that they roll on like this when they learn Gemara and when they do things. So I'm using it. You can't see me, but I'm using it as a, a way of thinking about everything. So how do you say in English tarte mashma? It's like uh, two meanings for all of that. That's the collage, the, the name of the whole collage. Usually. Together. Hmm? Multiple, me multiple meanings. Multiple meanings, yeah, that's right. So that works all together alongside this uh, closet room that is in... It, it's very big. I mean, it's uh, it's two meters high. So you can come with me into the closet room as if. That's another thing. Oh. Yeah. And then there's another video of lights. The sunlight that comes through the, 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 um, the window and makes shadows and light and fragments of light on the wall. And even the light is with barriers with something. And as you go around, then there is something which is hidden, a video which is hidden. And you go around and around. And then you see a, a different one, a colorful one. Yeah, go. And then you see just a woman walking and walking and walking and walking. She doesn't get anywhere, but she goes. So all of these are fragments of my story. As you can see, you can decide what the story is. Um, I don't know what to say more. Can <laughs> um, I take it from here and go to my side? What? Can I take it from here and go to my side and then we'll... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So this wall is a wall that has two uh, 
one work is mine and one work is Eleanor's. That's the hidden wall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's a place where we also where we also join together. And here, uh, this work, I don't know how well you could see it in the virtual tour. Um, let me see if I could pull it up. Uh, pull it up as a picture. Um, one second. Hmm. Hmm. Here. This is the work. It's a small boat that is um, sailing against the wind. That's the name of the piece. Um, and for this is a, this is a. Did everyone get to see that? That work? Did that share work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me go back. <clears throat> okay. Um, um, and this is a piece that symbolizes to me uh, being going against, being able to go against the tide, not giving up um, um, the force of, of human nature despite the odds. And it's a, it's based on a story that my father told me when I was when I was a teenager about his own experience witnessing a boat and create uh, a small little boat. Uh, sailing against the wind when, when, when he was probably a little bit older than a teenager, but not much. And uh, for me, it's very symbolic. And um, as Eleanor says, that her, her work is a collage. Well, my work is a collage of different stories put together. Um, not, a collage, not, a, not a fragment of pieces that make a story, but rather many different stories that, that come together and, and make one narrative. Um, so I'll keep going. And here, here is a sack. Once again, I'm going to try to pull it up as a picture. <coughs> um, here. Okay, so this is a sack full of ashes that I've picked up from the Jerusalem forest, um, right near Yad Vashem. And it's a, it's a, a sack that's used in construction and has been um, decorated with uh, wedding gown material. Um, and I based it off of an Israeli ch children's story called um, uh, Hasim Lat Shabbat Shalchanel, right? That's the, that's the name of it, Eleanor? What? Asimlat Shabbat Shalchanan. Okay, Shabbat. Yeah, Hanale, I know. I always turn it around, and it's about, which is about a story of a young girl who gets lost uh, before Shabbat when she's all dressed pretty in a nice white dress, and um, and she meets. I'll tell it very shortly, and she meets a uh, old man carrying a sack of ashes along the way, and he asks her to help to help him. And she very happily and innocently helps him, and she gets dirty from all the ashes. And the man keeps going, and she realizes that the sun is setting, which means she has to get home for Shabbat. And she realizes that if she comes home, they'll see that her dress is, her nice new dress is dirty. And so she sat and started crying, and the moon looked down at her and cleaned up her, her dress. Now, this is, this is a, um, uh, this is a story that's that, that's told very innocently to children, um, but um, as an adult, it sounds like something a little bit more traumatic than that, and um, and so that's a contrast that really that really pulls at me and talks about a journey and about healing and and um, so that's that's next. Now I'm going to see if I could. Go back with this one. Okay, here is an old man. This to me is an old man in a forest with a very long beard and a cane in his hand. Um, 
And to me, he's an ar ar archaic symbol of, of, uh, of a journey. Um, a lot of times in, um, in Yiddish and Midrashic and Hasidic folklore, there's, you meet the old man along the way, and he helps you get to where you need to go. Um, so he's there. I have another image of the ship as well, here in the corner. And here I have a whole installation room made out of canvas, which is more or less like a drawing. Um, and I also built it in a way that would be like a drawing. It gets smaller towards the end as if it's built with perspective. And it's made out of canvas in, um, on one side. And here I have a lot of items that are made out of uh, lint. And um, each item is inspired by the story Goodnight Moon, which is an American story um, about a little gram about a grandmother saying hush to a child um, and encouraging him to go to sleep by helping him um, depart with all of the little things in the house that are precious to him. <clears throat> and I chose different pieces out of that story and made it out of lint. Um, here, inside the hearth, I have a, um, a video which was uh, also in a Jew Jewish art salon exhibit in Jerusalem Biennale of me and my mother going through old, uh, old sentimental documents and drawings and, and, um, and burning them in, in the forest, which connects to the ashes that I put inside the sack outside of the installation. Um, I'll just skip through it a little bit because we don't have enough time just to get a sense of, of what, what is going on there in the hearth. This is a version two of what was displayed in the um, Jewish Art Salon exhibit, Jerusalem Between Heaven and Earth, um, and, and more emphasizes the burning. Of memories? Yes. Um, the, drawings, the drawings are from when I'm a little girl all the way through present time. And, um, and my mother also chose certain things that she would also like to burn. Um, including a diary that my grandmother wrote that she felt was important for her to burn to save, to, to keep my grandmother's privacy. It was the same year that she had passed away. <clears throat> and so I welcome the viewer to come and sit down in this nice rocking chair, just like the grandmother would have sat and said, hush, and to watch Watch the hearth. Um, and so this is, this is my installation room, which also, um, um, I love working with the space. And here, when someone walks by, they could look in and see everything as well, the little room from the outside. Um, so that's, that's this is the word. And it's, and it works through um, the life cycle. Um, it works through um, processing trauma, um, intergenerational trauma, um, and which you, and some of the references are just like just like Eleonora says. You know, you see, you you, you connect to the story where where it connects to you. Um, here, for example, this sack. Some people. In Jer it was, you know, it's, it's in Jerusalem, and some people in Jerusalem thought about terror attacks and about the, um, about something that happened just a few blocks from this gallery. Um, yeah, because someone is asking where the gallery is. That's on Jaffa Street, quite close to the um, Machne Yudha Shuk. Mm -hmm. Right. So that was hard for people to, to, um, ignore, you know, so I think it's very much, you know, 
very much based on where I, I put up the exhibit and you know it's gonna in, it's gonna cause a different reaction and a different connection to what story I'm bringing in um, and and so yeah so that's that how are we for time Yona should we do um, we should now? we should get yeah I, I was just trying to uh, message Goldie oops um, Goldie, I need to download uh, Bilga's file. Uh, would you have a chance to moderate the questions? First of all, everybody, if you'd like to ask a question, go to the chat uh, box, which is the bottom of the screen, and there is a feature there to raise your hand. So if you have a question or a comment, uh, please raise your hand. And it was on the chat, there was a, a question. That's Beta Gallery, that's on Jaffa Street. Right. No, I mean, um, I, I meant something else. There is also a way that participants, oh, you know what? I'm sorry, it's not in the chat box. It's in the participants box. Um, there is a function for people to raise their hand. And if you have a question, mm -hmm. please raise your hand. And then Goldie, if she's available. Yeah, um, I can do it. Okay, great. We'll uh, call on everybody uh, in turn. In the meantime, um, okay, so everybody, have, if you have a question or comments, go ahead, raise your hands. Oh, several people already did. I have a very quick question for both ladies. First of all, thank you. Really fascinating um, presentation. Um, and I'm completely bowled over by the way you did it with this 3D program. What is it called? Is it something uh, user friendly? <laughs> because this is fantastic. <laughs> This is a gift from the Jerusalem municipality because of Corona. And oh. so we're using that. they came, uh, a photographer came in and it's called uh, 360, right? And um, they put it up on the website. So I don't know exactly how they did it, but it was definitely very appreciated. Yeah. Oh, oh, wait, I have to get a screenshot of that. Yes. Great. All right. Okay, I am leaving uh, to find Tabilha's presentation. And in the meantime, Goldie will uh, call on people. Once she calls on you, please unmute yourself to speak. Thanks so much. Okay, so the first raise hand we have is from Elizabeth. Would you like to unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentations. I'd like to know how you felt um, burning all your work. How did it feel, the finality of it? Uh, did you take any, uh, I'll just stop here. How did you feel about burning such a history of your work? Um, I felt, I felt like, um, like, uh, I was burning chametz before Passover. Um, I, I think it's a very similar process. It was, it was, it was a lot of things. Of course, there were some, some things that I chose not to burn, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it took up uh, a whole a whole shed of space, and um, and I was having a hard time letting go of it. And um, and I think it's not easy to see because letting go is not easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you regret any afterwards? Did you? regret burning any of it or once it was gone it was gone um, I didn't regret any of it the only, the only one, one that, that I still that feel uh, um, I, I still get strong questions about is my grandmother's diary which wasn't my decision it was my mother's decision um, and so it could be as a granddaughter I wouldn't have thought about protecting my grandmother's privacy and would have rather to read it mm -hmm. um, Hi. Uh, wonderful presentation by both of you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, there's one general question to both of you, and actually it's a question, of course, to all of us who make art, and that is, uh, who do you conceive to be your audience? That's question one. Comment two, or maybe question, um, uh, Yehudis, uh, I'm a little bit familiar with your work. We, we met in Jer Jerusalem. Um, your work seems to me very much about memory and about uh, a personal a personal take on things. Uh, in contrast, interestingly enough, to uh, Eleonora, 
um, that you, you describe yourself as a clandestine artist, and I see exactly what you mean. In fact, I'm wondering, could you tell me something about what you think about transgression, transgression in terms of your work? You're asking me? Sure. Yeah, there you go. Translate transgression. Avera. <laughs> I <Right>. guess. <laughs> Avera. Avera? Avera. The, um, hate, hate. Uh, hate, hate. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> okay. What I do is, is mostly um, from my inner side of myself and the life of women who are um, dominated by male um, thoughts, which are not especially and fundamentally from the Torah. So I was like, for me, that's, that's the point of what am I doing with my identity as a woman against those attacks? So I don't know what to answer. And I'm addressing all kinds of, who, whoever wants to come see should come see. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not that I'm addressing Dafka, the uh, Chiloni side or whatever. Whoever comes in and can connect. Right. And I saw a lot of people of all, all kinds of people connecting because it's, it's, it's inter internal, so. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. The reason I'm asking specifically, of course, is that um, uh, your concern in your videos with the body, uh, your, the concern of uh, one of your performances in which you wear a man's, you specifically said a man's white shirt, the uh, mimicking of a, uh, a of the twirling of, of a payas are transgressive in the sense that they are crossing a gender boundary that yeah. um, a secular person may not get. But a person who has an understanding of uh, a from religious world will very much get and either uh, be offended or be made to think. Uh, it, it, it's, it, meaning it's going to be seen very differently from different audiences. Um, True. And, and uh, it's a very important f factor in your work, clearly. Uh, yeah. And, and I'm, not asking this, I'm not asking this as an outsider, I'm asking this as an insider because certainly a lot of the work that I do also is, is involved in one kind of transgression or another. And it's, you know, as-, as I like working on the borders, yes. Yes, I do. Okay. exactly, exactly. <laughs> Before we move on to Bilha, two more things. Uh, the Jewish Art Salon has organized these sessions, but they're co-sponsored by JADA. And Jonatas Chaiman of JADA will speak very briefly about some things. Also, you all need to know that both he and I are going to put some links into the chat. And you don't need to copy and paste those right away because you can all save the chat later on when the meeting is over. Jonatas, please say a few words about JADA. No, thank you, Jonas. Thank you so much for this. Uh, you are a huge mo role model for Jara, as you know. Uh, thank you everyone for being here right now. Elinora and Yehudi, it's uh, incredible. This presentation is incredible. Uh, Jara is a meta-modern organization, meaning we have questions that deal with the now. And we truly believe that we are going past the post-modern period. Uh, the way we operate is we come together as artists via collaborations such as this very important one with the Jewish Art Salon and we create art fairs, uh, artists in residence programs and we have one coming up right now going, we're going to Paris, Jada Paris, art fair and artists in residence program for the nine, from the 19th of October to the 30th and Jewish Art Salon members get 25% discount. So uh, as uh, Yona mentioned, uh, there is a way to get the link and all of that at the end. I'm also putting here on the chat something about our Jewish, uh, sorry, uh, about the Jada Art Journal. And the Jada Art Journal addresses questions. It, it accepts articles and art that will talk about the demise of art for art's sake, uh, the new informed naivety, and the rise of the digital romantics. All of that deals with what we believe is this uh, meta-modern uh, understanding of the life of the now for the new normal. 
So if anybody has any questions, please reach out to me. I'm here to chat with you at any time in any way possible. Thank you so much, Yona and everybody for listening. Thank you, Yona Tas. And I would like now to introduce Goldie, who will moderate Bilha's section. For the Jewish Art Salon, Goldie has curated or co-produced 12 exhibitions so far and has single-handedly made it her business to introduce younger members and students to the salon. On our website, you may want to check out her latest endeavor, which matches Jewish Art Salon members, whether they're artists or scholars, with interns, both remote interns and in-person interns. So um, Goldie is a member of the MET Collective. Uh, they develop and implement innovative programming for students at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And she will study for a master's degree in art history at New York University this fall. And she's currently an intern at Hadassah Brandeis Institute. Okay, Goldie, please introduce Bilha to us. Okay, so Bilha Zussman studied graphic art in Amsterdam where she lives and works. Her art has been exhibited in the 2017 Jerusalem Biennale. She's the initiator and co-curator of the exhibition Spinoza Murano of Reason in Amsterdam last year. It was awesome, you should all check it out on the website. This exhibit was organized by the Jewish Art Salon uh, and I was the curator. Uh, curatorial assistant for it. Bilha works at the Jewish Historical Museum in Amsterdam and Education Department. She describes herself as a secular Jew, a daughter and granddaughter of Jews from Eastern Europe. Her father immigrated to Israel shortly before the Second World War. She was born on a kibbutz and was brought up as a new Sabra. Bilha has made several short art videos. You know, will put YouTube links to some of these in the chat form so you can view them later. Um, Bilha, take it away. Okay. Uh, but before, well, uh, the title of my presentation is, well, you can see it, Why aren't Bila and Zilpa counted as Jewish matriarchs? Um, I assume you all know the story of the foremothers of Bila and Zilpa, the um, handmaids. Um, just to be sure, um, uh, a very, very short intro about this, in fact, horror story from the Bible. Um, <clears throat> sorry, in a few sentences, a Bila is a person mentioned in Genesis. Genesis describes her as Laban handmaid who was given to Rachel, Rachel, to be her handmaid on Rachel marriage to Jacob. When Rachel failed to have children, she gave Bilha to Yaakov to wife to bear him children. Rachel and Leah, as you all know, as we all know, are sisters. Both marries, married to uh, Jacob and desperately went to, assure, to be sure of to be assured by Jacob's love to him. Uh, the more quantity of children, the more the value to him. Rachel, the beautiful, the favorite, adored by Jacob, Leah ignored. Leah the fertile, Rachel the barren one. So it's give you a clue to where this tale is heading. Rachel and Leah, Procreation battle between two brides through the handmade wombs and the husband Jacob, a battle which result in Jacob being shuttled from bedroom to bedroom, from tent to tent. Rachel occupied with a contest between herself and Leah, a head to head confrontation. Participant in, the, in this du, uh, duel is Rachel, Leah, Bilha, Zilpa, and Yaakov. And it goes like this. Leah bears her first child, then the second, the third, and the fourth. Rachel, desperately, desperately jealous of her sister's fruitfulness, demands children from Jacob. Her bareness is Jacob's fault, she insists. Desperately jealous, Rachel finds a solution. If she could not have a child herself, she comes up with a second option, her handmaid Bilha. 
Jacob was all too happy to oblige and Bill popped to more boys and stand well for two. It's now Leah Terence, but she's a bit tired. She already has four children. So she said, if Rachel can employ her maid in this context, so can she. Sister, what you can do, I can do better. So it's now Zilpah's turn and Jacob again happy to oblige. And it is ongoing contest, more children. Um, Leah gives Jacob two more boys and girls, but girls does not count, are always forgotten. Rachel finally gives birth to two more boys and this combat gets freakier. There are some shenanigans with mandrakes, aphroditiacs. Rachel and Leah are included in the Jewish woman pantheon. Bila and Zilpa are excluded. They are sieved out, filtered. We have six mother who gave birth to 12 sons, ancestors of the 12 tribes of Israel. The erasure of Bila and Zilpa from our traditional consciousness is an emblem of the exclusion of marginalized women in society. The status of Bila and Zilpa in the Bible is called, I say it in Hebrew, Pilegesh, Peleg Isha, which translate half a woman. Both Bila and Zilpa never speaks their ancestress. Well, the history is inhibited with nobodies who never choose to be nobody. In this, um, well, we incline to read these histories long ago and far away. That could be far away from the truth the Bible is now. One uh, more, uh, I want to add, what strikes in this uh, chapter in Genesis is how cruel these ladies are to each other. Rachel physically man uh, manipulation of Bila such that Rachel is vicariously giving birth through her. Bila's sons will be attributed to Rachel who names their children taunting her old sister with their names. Calling this lady cruel, of course, that's not the only way to interpret the situation. They are maneuvered into this cruel breeding contest. And the only way to survive, to use this, um, to, the only way to survive is to use the same vocabulary and toolbox used against them by the oppressor. One can argue that the core of their cruelty lies in the notion that they depend on each other. Um, the four of them are trapped in a master-slave situation. There is no way out. So, to start with, Yana, great job. I see it already. My Bible notebook is a sort of fragmented landscape, a patchwork of symbols, objects from the kitchen household, a toolbox allowing the ladies to handle their surrounding in their own terms, own language. And the sieve, you can see it here, is the ultimate tool which, in, as far as I'm concerned, enables me to translate all this history into images. And now back to the image, the sieve in many culture, well, you've read it already, female intimacy, fundamental symbol and separation and filtration and so on and so on. Jana, the second, uh, the next, um, okay. Is this an animation? Is that what you're yeah. going to play? Yeah. It's part of an animation uh, film. I, it's still work in progress, but just to give you the, the an, an impression, how I use the sieve. 
I hope you'll hear also the sound. I'm not sure about it. Um, we don't hear a sound. No, not yet. Oh, oh, oh. Within a few seconds. Otherwise, well, pech. <laughs> I'm happy I'm so far. <laughs> Do you hear it? Yep. The next image. Yeah, I divided um, all the stuff I have into two, uh, uh, three main chapter. The first one is Bilarena. So all the tools on this mattress the lady can use in order, well, in a way to squeeze their own language via uh, these uh, tools. And the second one, well, we see here, um, um, sieves, you see, oh yeah, this is also part of the tools, horn, vegetable steamer, and so on, and, and we'll see soon how they use it. Egg Genesis, Egg Genesis, this is the, this is the second chapter about eggs. These are notes, so it's still not the whole story, but the egg, War of the Sieve, Disguise Egg. You can watch the whole film in um, YouTube. So you can see also all these uh, objects moving and, and it's... And, and, uh... Yes, I will put a link in the chat box. Yeah. Next one. Yeah. Uh, you need six for a tango. We have four mothers, but in fact, six. The Bride Breakdance and the Battle of the Bride. Breakdance, I choose this title because uh, within the break uh, um, scene, it is all about expressing your own style, about being original. And the most important aspect of breakdance is the battle. They are competing with each other. So these ladies and the battle of the bride. These are uh, details of the battle of the bride. This combat gets freakier. There are some shenanigans with mandrakes. And again, read this story again, because the more I read it, the more it, it's an, a beautiful story. It's about, in fact, Women were trapped. Well, then six mother, twelfth tribe of Israel. And here, yeah, in any in any, the way, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is um, another uh, chapter. The six hundred thirteen mitzvot commandment. What I did here, I constructed the um, digit 613 out of empty um, bike tires that are empty. The digit one is in fact a shadow. 
So at sunset, it disappeared. So the whole concept and the whole idea, spirit of this 613 mitzvot disappeared, fade away. So you see here, it fades away and what left over. And please the next. Um, so you see here the bike. Pump. This is a set of the bike. Pump. Yeah. So in fact, this um, bike pump, this metal, it's a piece of metal, um, is holding, well, a bunch of information. It is this digit one which holds everything together. Well, that's it. Let's see, Judith has a question. Like yes, hi. Um, I loved all the presentations and I just want to thank you all for all this work that's making my head very uh, stimulated. Um, my question is for Bilha. Um, you made a reference to the Siv as a kind of a cross-cultural symbol of women's intimacy and I'm not familiar with that. Can you speak a little about that? Uh um, well, it is um, about um, intimacy, uh, which means it has to be with licking, well, because women is associated with, you know, fluids with licks, which, uh, and um, it's also, um, you find it, you find a lot of Jewish customs uh, which um, use the the um, sieve. There's a Jewish custom in the Caucasus and also in Egypt, in other places, uh, uh, um, still uh, used when a, a newborn um, is, um, they put it him directly the moment he's born in a sieve. So it's as a, a sieve. It, it's about um, uh, separating the, the the good and the evil. What you need, what you uh, want to live out. This is the the and um, just you find it in 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 art history, in philosophy, in psychology, uh, in. Um, gender studies, they all use this uh, uh, symbol, um, which has to do with femininity. Uh, so the, the child, they put him, talking about this custom, they put him in a, in, in, in a sieve. In a way, it is his first cradle. It's if they wish him, well, a lot of wisdom, separate the good and the evil from, well, I find it a great, I don't know why they don't use it everywhere, but well. So um, you can read really, there are a lot of pub, uh, publications about the sieve, connecting uh, to, I can send you a lot of uh, information if, if uh, you need, uh, because we are short of time, but it's Thank really, you. you find it in every field and, and a lot of these who are now um, uh, deal with gender studies, you'll find this symbol everywhere. Thank you, that was new to me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Rina has a question. First of all, I just really want to say hello to Eleonora. I haven't seen you for a long time in Yehudis. And also, Bilha, it's really such a pleasure to see all three of you. And my compliments to Yona for curating, I, I assume it was Yona, but I don't know, maybe it was you, Goldie, who curated these three pieces together because it's a fascinating mix of the, the um, I like the way Bilha brings out the how we got to the hiddenness that is in Yehudit, uh, Yehudis and Eleonora's pieces. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have so much hiddenness in your works, you two. With Eleonora, you, you, you know, contrasting your work in the closet and then going out into the open air, which mm -hmm. is just, yeah, you really, you've moved, you've moved pretty far since we first met. And the bag of ashes, you heard this, the, that to me looks like it's about building and to you it's about destruction, which is very, very interesting also. And the softness of your installation um, um, with the burning of the artwork. Yeah. 
Um, I, I I agree. It is about building. It's, it's but it's that uh, it's destruction and then building. Yeah, it ends up a lot in my book. It's so such a powerful softness there. That's very very interesting. And the hiddenness again in that you know inside outside with the house. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me, I, I hate to ask you because it seems like it's a sore spot with you, but did your mother read the diaries before she burned them or did she leave them unread? Um, she, she, I, I think she went through them. She did read them. I think so, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. So was that hard for you to know that she got to see them and you didn't? It's killing me. <laughs> <laughs> It is. Well, I, as I said, it's, 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 if there's anything there that we burned that I, I don't feel, you know, completely, okay, with. It, would, it, it would be that. But I also, um, I understand the story and I respect it. I respect the decision. Yeah, but this idea of filtering that Bilha talks about with the sieve, filtering mm -hmm. out and erasing women. I mean, actually, Rachel and Leah are also erased. All of those children don't become their children. They become Yaakov's children. So it's a cycle of erasing women all together that you guys, all three of you, are talking to. Thank you so much for speaking my heart. That's it. <laughs> Thanks. Anna Zalik has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, your work just... Um, like Judith, my mind is just, um, it's just a flutter. So um, I, I just, I noticed something that in all of your work is so um, heavily laden with psychoanalytic imagery. Like in Eleonora's work, um, you know, there's this light being occluded. And whenever you see a closet and cabinets, I, I think of psychoanalysis. I think of the idea that you're spilling all this out and but your unconscious is still, still covered. And then, you know, the other layer is, you know, you have Kisoi Roche, you have something on your head, but you're also kind of exposing one little bit of hair. And that's like, it's Erva, it's the exposure, but it's also the rest of you is hidden. So you, you know, you're, you're showing and you're not showing. And then there's the obvious, you know, this burning of memory in Yehudas's work. And I, I think about your grandmother, I think about this sometimes when I'm writing something and I go, oh my God, I don't want my child to see this when I'm dead. You know, you just kind of are just like, I, I you know, this is, this is private. Do I want anybody to know about it? So there is a kind of respect in the burning that, you know, she might not want you to see this. this the, these journals were just for her. And then, um, and also the idea that the viewer and the view, like there's some, I love that rocking chair, looking at someone burning, you're burning your experience, someone is watching you, and then out the window, someone is watching the person watching. So there is also that psychoanalytic thing. And then with Bilha, this idea that the handmaids were just wombs, and, you know, they were just like, you know, surrogates, wombs for hire, and that yeah. all of your objects have holes in them. And, you know, that there's just this material going through the holes and it's just, it's almost like the sieve is less important than the material going through them. And then the bike pump, it's so kind of, kind of such Freudian almost imagery of there's this long pump and then there's somebody who's got to pump stuff into it. And it's just something, I, anyway, I, I, this isn't really a question. This was just really a comment that there's this psychoanalytic thread going through all of it. And, um, Thank you. <laughs> That's pretty much all I, I just wanted to say. Judith, another hand raised. Yes, I, I do have another question for um, Yehudas and uh, Eleonora. Um, I missed the beginning of, of the bio for Yehudas, but um, Eleonora, it seems clear that you went from a more secular um, upbringing, perhaps, to um, a, a traditional Haredi environment. Yehudas, I don't know if you did the same, but my question is, um, I would like you both to, to tell me how, how it is making art in the environment of a traditional Haredi community versus a secular community. How does that feel to you as artists? How, is, how does it impact you? Eleonora. Well, for me, it's the essence of the thing, of my art, the, the conflict between my other life and my life now, which is 
as an artist, they don't know me as an artist where I live. Nobody knows, not, not my family, not, not my friends, not my neighbors. I mean, um, because they're not in the internet and they're not into journals or anything like that. So I'm like free to do whatever, but I do it secretly. They don't know about it. So no, I understand what you meant. It. Have I'm you sorry. thought of sharing it with, with anybody in your community or is that just off the table? No, not in my community. No, <laughs> no. Because you feel yeah, that as, be... as an artist, I'm not, I'm not being discovered as an artist. How does, how do you feel? I mean, in a sense you're living, well, you're obviously living a dual life, but I mean, does yeah. it pain you that you can't share that important part of yourself with, with the people you love and live among? Um, I do share my ideas. They don't know that I do it and I present it. I, I share my ideas, what I think about women and whoever I feel close to me and it's not dangerous for me to reveal what I think about, then I talk about it. But not with a, it's not a community thing. It's one-to-one -one thing. If you, if you, if they became aware of what you were doing, do you, so that would have uh, social implications for you and your community? Yeah, yeah it can be very dangerous, yeah. Okay, well, kola kavod, I mean, the work is, it's, it's from deep in. Yehudas, do you have any um, observations on that topic? Um, so my story is different. I'm, I'm in a different kind of community, first of all. It's, um, I'm Hasidic, but it's not an extreme, it's, it's less extreme, I think, than a Lenore's community. Um, that's first of all. Second of all, I, I did grow up, I did grow up also Orthodox, and um, my my identity as an artist has been ever since I'm little, um, and it's been something I've grappled with ever since I'm little. Um, and it's a comp, it's, it's a complex answer because it's it's not something very common or understood. Um, so that immediately it stranges my connection to art making. I think today things have changed. There there, there is. More, there are more initiatives of bringing art into the Haredi community or giving opportunities of art for Haredi, for Haredi artists. Um, so they're definitely around. I mean, they're definitely, they're, there are Haredi artists. I think there's more, more men than there are, there, there are more men who are known as artists in the Haredi community than there are women. Um, even though there's plenty of women creative uh, we're talking about fine artists, there's, there are more men than women. Um, so, so it's complicated. I feel like on one hand, um, I'm less, it's, I'm just not so understood, I think is the feeling that I've always had. Um, and on the other hand, I try to make an effort to, to get over my anxiety of not being understood and bring it to my community anyway. So. Um, for example, in 2015, I think it was, when in the, in the Jerusalem Biennale, um, I did, I helped curate an exhibit, um, and for, for her, that was, that was something that Haredi people could come to, and for me, it was an incredible experience, because there really were a lot of Haredi people who came to the opening and looked at the works and, and a Haredi mother came to me and was so excited about my work. And for me, that was a really healing experience. Um, and so, and also I, I've opened up a community studio in my, uh, where I live uh, for women to come and make art as an, as an open studio once a week. Um, you know, it's not not fine arts, but but um, but I I believe that that people you know there's plenty of people who are happy to to be creative, um, and then there's always a feeling that there's something there's a bit of a part of me that they don't completely understand what I'm what I'm doing or what I'm up to. <laughs> Maybe that fuels your work on some level. Who knows? Sometimes um, having to push against something can be very um, 
exciting and it's in a strange way <laughs> it can cause you to value it more yeah it's something something about the motif of the uh of the boat sailing against the wind there you go <laughs> Um, okay, so I see Pearl physically raising your hand. Hi, uh, yeah, because I don't have a hand at the bottom. Sorry. So I have a question. First of all, thank you. Wonderful Im imagery. Love the innovations. I have a question for Eleonora. As I was watching you pour the coffee down the white shirt, and looking at the images that came out on the shirt and on your face, I was reminded by the uh, Middle East uh, practice of uh, reading uh, coffee. And I wanted to know that when, it, when you looked at the video yourself, uh, what you saw or what you wanted to say or have the audience see with this the, the coffee and the images on the white shirt? Well, um, to begin with, when I started with it to drink and pouring out, that was just to pour out this usual thing of drinking coffee and making it like go beyond border. But then I noticed this thing that was on the shirt in the gallery when it was we, uh, somebody came in and she was a Koret Bakafe. That's the thing. She's uh, an expert. So she was standing there and she told me, I didn't really think about it. And so, and she was saying like, I'm seeing ha a hand. I saw a hand and I see that you're dealing a lot with hands. And then she saw, I saw Eretz Israel. The v it was like the shape of Eretz Israel on the map. And then she saw a horse and she was talking about it, it was really fascinating because I didn't think about it. You can't really think about all those details. The thing was to make myself dirty, to make things, um, you know, so it was really fascinating to hear it. <laughs> okay. Because, you know, as an artist, I, you know, I realized that I could read, you know, I lived in Israel for a long time, especially Turkish coffee, but yeah, right. That's so. Coffee. So it I is. remember, you know, looking at someone's coffee cup after she drank, right. and I said, "Wow, I can see all these images." Right. And I realized that if someone was sitting beside me, I could just say, "Okay, turn over the cup mm -hmm. and look." Right. And I once took a picture of a coffee cup where uh, Moshe Rabbeinu appeared. Uh -huh. holding the Lechot the Ten Commandments, and the word Shaddai, God, was in it. So, you know, that's what I really saw, you know, the coffee. So if you send me a picture, I gladly look. Okay. And, you know, <laughs> there are people who create using tea, artist, tea, coffee. So thank you, all of you. It was absolutely wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Of the hands we have raised, because we're right after Bilha's session, are any of these questions specifically for Bilha? I see Richard waving. Yeah, uh, Bilha, um, uh, first of all, thanks so much. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, I want to start working on is um, uh, really all of the women of the Torah and Tanakh, and uh, especially the ones that are less, less recognized, and of course Bilha and Zilpa, are, are at the top of the list. Um, the, the approach that you have, I mean, first of all, it's revealing for women trapped in a, ma a master-slave relationship or a mistress-slave relationship, I assume you mean, uh, is revealing. Uh, I think, though, that um, I know by seeing your work, it actually inspires me to do something that's called reading against the grain, uh, because we see the Torah presents them in a certain light, or seems to. And I think perhaps sometimes our job might be to see them uh, totally differently. In fact, to investigate them as full, whole human beings who have, who actually have um, to do essentially, by the way, what the Midrashim do. Open up their stories as, as, as people to see them perhaps, uh, you could 
either imagine or actually see it within the text itself as working within a family unit and as not being dominated, but actually being, remember, they're in the majority. They are, pardon the expression, holding the goods that, quote, Yaakov needs and wants and the Jewish nation needs and wants. So to re-see them in that way, um, it, it could be very um, liberating. Much, perhaps even in the same way, just to address Yehudis and the, the poor you, you're, you're, you're uh, saddled with your mother's decision to burn your grandmother's diary, you know, sometimes, sometimes you, you all know, sometimes we have to let go of things. We have to let go of the past. Um, um, you know, we will all probably experience the death of someone close to us. And at that point, you can't talk to them anymore. And it's very painful, but it's also a part of how we have to go on with our own lives. Uh, and, um, and perhaps that was, maybe that's a, another way to quote, read what the emotions are of, of that diary no longer being, well, that has to be a bit like, now that's done. The path, with so much of, of current art is about memory and about history, sometimes I think we have to push against that grain and say, well, but we have to go past our memory and past our history so, because to create new, and it can be liberating if we conceive of it that way. Um, uh, anyway, that's kind of it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, Sandy has a question. Sandy, please unmute yourself. My question is, uh, how did um, how did Yehudis and Eleanor meet each other and decide to collaborate on the art project? And also, um, Yehudis mentioned um, like who funded it and supported it. So I was curious about that. And also like to say the things that I love. I, I love the coffee, the painting from the coffee one and, and from your head is the thing with the, the long beard went all the way down to the ground. So, so, um, I, I didn't catch something, the way you said, um, was something that I said and you wanted to hear more about? Um, yes, um, you, you mentioned who supported the project at the beginning. Oh. So curious about that and how you guys met and decided to collaborate. Well, um, first of all, we met through a, a great um, artist how, artist organization, I guess it should be called, called Studio of Her Own, which is an initiative um, by Tsipi Mizrahi, who founded it, um, for, for uh, um, helping promote uh, religious woman artists. Um, she, she saw how challenging it was to hold down the court on so many levels and, and um, uh, become more established as an artist at the same time. And she built this initiative and me and Eleanor are both part of that group. So that's how we met. And, um, I think one of my, my greatest gratitudes to that group is the networking that I've been able to do of many women who are, uh, who are struggling as I am and not giving up as I am to establish themselves as artists. So, um, and, and actually one of the, one of the, uh, um, one of the people who's part of the executive community, co the committee is listening right now. Her name is Hetty Abramowitz. So I was happy to see her here joining us. Um, so that's how we met. And uh, Mifala Pais is a, is an Israeli initiative for um, um, every year they come out with a uh, call for art for people in Israel to apply for exhibitions or artist books. Um, and for two years they had a section for ultra orthodox artists, which is nice. This year they took it down, unfortunately. Okay. Um Someone else had a question. Okay, Jonatas had a question. Thank you, Jonas, so much. For, this is a question for everybody uh, who presented today. Uh, a question with, uh, if you can summarize in a very short answer, this question. I believe that everybody who presents him or herself as a, an artist uh, happens to also be an activist. 
we often have a message that is in a way or another transgressive uh, depending on the community where you are, your audience. There's always something that you're saying that is not accepted by everyone. Um, would you call yourselves an activist of some kind? And then what is your calling? What is your, what is your activism about? If you see yourself as such. Bill, how would you like to start off answering that question? I, well, this is quite a question. What an activist. There are so many forms of activism. So um, what I'm doing um, is I'm working at the Jewish Historical Museum, at the, the um, uh, educational uh, department, and we're working with children and um, what very important for me is to, because we still uh, face here anti-Semitism and so on and so on, and just to educate the youngest. So this is my way of being active, not only within the Jewish community. I don't really live here in a Jewish community. It's a mixed community, mm. but well, activism is such a, range of, well, of so many actions and, and, and so in a way, but it's, it's hard for me, what do you understand on the activist? Mm -hmm. So I'm throwing the ball back to you. <laughs> yeah. It's both uh, scary and uh, powerful to see ourselves as activists and a uh, very interesting uh, answer that you just provided. Thank you so much dealing with children. How about the other presenters? How do you, how do you see yourselves? I, I do feel like an activist, mm -hmm. even, even though I don't go in the streets, you know, yeah. and, uh, and uh, uh, crying in Gewalt, you know, in sure. the but I do think I do try, I do cry, give out about the situation. And I'm so happy to see, I always watch the audience that come and mm -hmm. I see they get, they do relate to it and then they have a say about it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's like a, a starter yeah. of thinking, of showing. Yeah. And yeah. I, I feel like I, as when I took it from, from my inner voice to, out of voice, it's like communicating, and I, mm -hmm. I, I feel it. Well, the best kind of activism is the one that goes straight into the thought process, and you're influencing your audiences in a marvelous way, a very profound way. So it's definitely activism in a good one. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I feel. All right. How about you, Ehudis? Any, any? Do you feel that way at all? I, I, I would, I would respond more like Bila, like, ooh, activist. That's quite a, quite a. A big word. It's scary too. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, You're doing something transgressive there. And, and honestly, I, I don't know. Honestly, um, um, I I find I I really believe that art is is um, about uh, soul searching and um, not just soul searching, but also connecting to other people's soul searching, mm -hmm. and in that way, creating a community of experience. So that's, yeah. that's how I see it. I, I don't know if I would call it activism. I would sure. call it you know, to, mm -hmm. to get deeper and connect. Yeah. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Okay. I don't Thank you so much. I don't think there's anybody else um, raising their hand right now. So we're pretty much at the end of the meeting. I want to yeah. thank... Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. She didn't raise her hand. Sure. Bruria, go ahead. Un unmute yourself. It was a very interesting presentation, and the thing that I uh, heard in your presentation, uh, you know, their work, was that the Kabbalah was involved in their understanding and consciousness. And so I was looking for it in the presentation, and I was really stunned by uh, Bill Haas, um presentation, which had to do with Hineni and Enemy. 
And it is fascinating to me that the Hebrew language always has this amazing way of, with one word, to change your whole understanding of yeah. what is. Hineni, hey, nun, nun, yud. And Aneni is Aleph, A, uh, and, and Yud. Uh, and one is addressing the presence, and one is addressing the secret, or the, 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 the reveal um, of who we are really comes when we understand the secret. And uh, I think both are striving for it because Judith uh, and her Yehudith uh, had also addressed their work by saying uh, one can put into the work whatever they wish to say or find or, uh, or reveal for themselves. These are very uh, basic kind of understanding and search that is always part of the idea of the Kabbalah. And uh, I'm really impressed with both presentations. They're wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Nice to see you. Great. Any other questions of people who couldn't raise their hands in the chat? Okay, then I want to thank you all because this was really an exquisite pairing of presenters. I, and I had nothing to do with it. I mean, don't give me credit for something I didn't do. They did it themselves. Um, so uh, thank you, Bilha. Thank you, Yehudas. Thank you, Eleonora. This was really, really great. Um, this is the thank next you. to last session. The last one will be next week. Uh, Shoshana Guggenheim, who some of you know, will present her work that she presented as a thesis. And then we're on a small break. We may continue in the summer with a totally different session. Uh, and we may continue this in the fall. It all depends. Uh, in the meantime, thank you all for really making this a fantastic session. Uh, if any of you, I mean, I will send the chats to the presenters for sure. If anybody else wants a record of the chats with links or whatever, I'll be happy to send it. Just email me at jewishartsalon at gmail.com. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank week. you again. Thank, Thank you, Diana. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Iris. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye. Bye, Aina. Hello, everybody. Thank you. It was lovely bye. to see you. Shakwa. Bye. Bye. bye.